Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Walton and welcome to Quilt Stories. Today I'm talking to Shannon Conley, who is a fellow Studio Art Quilt member. Shannon's now on the board of SACWA and we met many years ago when I saw a presentation of her work at a SACWA conference and I absolutely fell in love with her 3D work and you're going to be amazed as well. There's also another side to Shannon that we're going to talk about. Welcome Shannon. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here and to get to share my work with your viewers and subscribers. Here is a photo of you with longer hair. I love that red. It actually goes with the quilt. I had pink hair for a long time and it would fade into red, but when I cut it short, all of it got cut off. I was very oh, sad. What a shame. I love color coordinated people. This is the work that we're going to have a look at in detail a little bit. It's one of your abstract or three-dimensional works. We're going to, oh, wow. <laughs> We're going to talk about some of them and how you got involved in working in 3D. So would you like to explain that a little bit? I really like texture and I really like depth. And I've always really liked 3D paper art, origami and kirigami. And I just wanted to figure out how could we do that in fiber? I don't have any training as a sculptor. I feel like if I ever went back to art school, I would love to go back and learn how to be an actual sculptor. And so I just jumped in with both feet and thought, how many different ways can I pull my art quilts into the third dimension? And what can I achieve with that approach that I can't achieve with something that's flat on the wall. And so that's been really valuable for me as I explore a lot of my inspirations, which come from the high desert and the mountains in Southern New Mexico, where there's so much texture and depth and repetition in organic forms. So I feel like three-dimensional work has been a great way to explore those themes. And then of course, this piece here is uh, one of my biological pieces. And we know all of our biological tissues are also three-dimensional. So I felt like this was a great way to interpret that. So you're actually not a full-time artist. Would you like to tell us what you are? I'm a cell biology professor. I do research and I study age-related changes in the blood vessels in the brain and how those can lead to cognitive impairment. And so this piece here was an interpretation of a endothelial cell glycocalyx, which is a structure that protects the cells that line your blood vessels. And that spiky structure is really there to help prevent things that shouldn't be in the brain from leaking into the brain. It's a sort of a metaphor for the ways that we protect ourselves and sometimes don't let people in and sometimes um, maybe let too many things in. So this piece is actually quite large. It's about four feet wide by four feet tall by 20 inches deep. And so it's hard to transport and it rejects you. You try to pick it up and it pokes you in every dimension. And so it's a very physical piece. The stick shapes were one milliliter pipettes that I took home from the lab when we were moving lab spaces. They had been in someone's storage closet for 25 years and they're not a tool that we use anymore. And I thought, I'm not going to throw away all that plastic. I'm going to use them for an art experiment. And so I painted all the fabric and created little sheaths for each of those plastic pipettes. They're like straws, only skinnier and sturdier <laughs> and now covered in fabric. And they will poke you in the eye if you get too close. They will, or in the arm as you try to carry it, or in the belly as you try to move around it. That's one of the problems, unfortunately, with 3D work, isn't it? It is. I have discovered over the last six or seven years that I've been making a lot of 3D work that shipping and hanging and displaying turns out to be a really big challenge. And it's sometimes a limiting factor. We like to think that we just want to make the work that we're called to make, but you have to figure out how you're going to display it. You have to figure out how you're going to get it someplace if you want to exhibit it. And those are not insignificant challenges with this kind of work. I'd love to see it in person. I just love those textures. So we're going to talk about High Desert Garden, which is a little bit of your signature style, isn't it? This sort of pleated or smocked type work. I got really confused when you sent me this image because I thought, that's not the fabric in High Desert Garden. High Desert Garden is one in a series of pieces that use traditional smocking techniques. 
I'm really drawn to traditional fiber arts approaches. I'm a terrible piecer, but I love the repetition of traditional quilt blocks and traditional applique blocks. I love that repetition of form. And so I thought incorporating smocking, which you would normally find in like a child's dress or something like that, into a contemporary art quilt would be a way to get that repetition of form without having to have matched corners. But all of my pieces in this series are start out with plain fabric that then I paint and I use acrylic paint or latex paint. I like the latex paint because you can get it from your local home improvement store in small test pots that are fairly inexpensive. And I use the fabrics that you see here because that's what was in my stash. I inherited several years ago, many boxes of random fabric from a good friend who was de-stashing. And so my goal is to use all these fabrics. And you can see that on their own, those fabrics are not very exciting, but I paint over them and then get to work. So High Desert Garden started with those quilts. You can see here my two helper dogs. I'm sorry to say those two dogs have passed away and I now have two more dogs, but all the dogs like to help in the studio. They like to help anytime there's anything on the floor. And you can see after that piece was painted, I've layered it there for quilting. One of the really interesting things to me about the 3D quilts is that the quilting comes very early in the process. I feel like for a lot of quilt artists, the quilting is almost one of the last steps, but for me, it comes very early and all of the sculpting and assembly and a lot of the creativity in the work comes long after the quilting. So for me, the quilting is a very early step. There you can see it all quilted. One of the things that's especially interesting to me about these smocked quilts is how much smaller they get. So just for size estimate, that piece of quilted fabric is about seven feet wide by five feet tall. And the finished piece is 40 inches square. So you lose a lot in that textured smocking process. And it's impossible to determine the size of the final project before. So this is really not a good approach if you are entering some call that needs a 20 by 20 square or a 30 by 30 square, you just take potluck. Yes, I know I have great trouble even when my quilts just flap. <laughs> I have trouble getting them to exact sizes like that. I try to avoid having to do that. So here you can see on the back, this is how the smocking is created. So that smocked texture is done by quilting different corners on a grid. So the back of the quilt is marked with marker in a grid like graph paper and then depending on which corners of those pieces of grass paper you stitch together, you'll generate the smocking uh, pattern on the other side. And so I will typically start with smocking patterns that are publicly available. But one of the things I've discovered is that what's suitable for a small little dress doesn't always translate well to a big thick quilt sandwich. And it takes a lot of trial and error to find smocking patterns that achieve the desired outcome. So see here, this is one that didn't work out. And one of the things that I always encourage people to do when they're working in 3D or even trying anything new is to just go for it. So this particular quilt, I like to show the in-process pictures because I tried three or four different smocking patterns before I found one that gave me the desired look in the finished product. So I stitched all this together and I didn't like it. And so then I just snipped all those threads on the back and flattened it back out and marked a new grid on the back. I've seen a lot of paper art with very complex folds like this. Is, is that one of your inspirations? It is. I'm very inspired by paper art. There's a whole realm of paper art with tessellated fold patterns. And I love that. It's again, that repetition of form. And I've struggled over the years because one thing that fabric doesn't do is hold creases. And I know that's counterintuitive to anyone who's ever seen their quilt hanging at a show with a big crease across the middle. But a lot of the paper art, the structure really comes from the ability of paper to hold a crease and the structural stability that those creases give. And so I've had a lot of fun over the years trying to adapt that type of approach to fabric. It's definitely something I'm interested in exploring. Oh, this was another one that didn't work. I tried it, didn't work. Does that depress you when you put all that work into it and then you have to unpick it? Not for these, because I feel like it takes a few hours, probably three or four hours to do that stitching. But each time is an experiment. Each time I learn 
something that I can apply going forward, either the size of the boxes were too small or the fold pattern was too complex to be implemented in a thick fabric sandwich. So I don't consider it wasted time. Um, I think it's one of those things that you just learn as you go through it. And because it's completely reversible, it's not super depressing. It's not like you finished a whole quilt and then the whole thing is horrible. And I've had some of those too. And in those cases, it's really sad. And then you put it in a closet and then six months later, you get it back out and paint over it and cut it off. But for these, it's actually just fun. You just keep, it's an iterative process. So you talked about latex paints and acrylic paint. So is it actually quite stiff in itself? It isn't because for me, I water the paints down a lot. So I don't want a stiff painted sort of feel like you would get on an oil painted canvas or something like that, or an acrylic painted canvas. So the paints, I water them down, maybe 30% paint, 60% water before I paint my fabrics and I paint the fabrics wet. And so in the end, the fabric is maybe a little stiffer than what normal fabric would be, but not actually a whole lot. And I think sometimes that's a detriment. A lot of these 3D pieces would benefit by having a stiffer structure. One of the problems with fabric and quilts is that they're floppy, which is just a challenge when you're making sculptural things. But for these, it's really good. And it's always nicer to quilt through things that are not super stiff and have thick paint. My sewing machine is happier with me. <laughs> so this one's really interesting. So this one is a slightly different method. You can see it doesn't have that smock structure. This one's structure is held together on the back by a wooden infrastructure, by some hand stitching that holds those undulations in place, and by fabric stiffener. Golden acrylic fabric stiffener is a sort of a clear glue-like substance you can paint over your quilt, and it is not enough to hold up a piece like this. So one of the things that you might not realize from looking at this hanging on the wall is that it's hanging slat is about halfway down the piece because the top part of the piece has lots of holes in it. I was playing with ideas of transparency and shadow casting. So you couldn't put a slat there. And when I first made this piece only with the hanging slat and the stiffener, I hung it on the wall and the whole top part flopped over, <laughs> which was very sad. Again, necessity is the mother of invention, I guess. You, you find something that doesn't work. And so then I built a sort of skeleton that helps hold it up. This piece was inspired by the wildflowers that bloom in the deep forests in southern New Mexico where I grew up. This one I adore because I know I did hear a presentation that you gave about how you made this. And I, I loved it from first sight. But when I heard the explanation of how you made it, I was just blown away by the complexity of it. Yeah, this was a challenging quilt and I've always really loved it. And I've wanted to make some more using this approach, but this approach was very physically demanding. My hands bled a lot when I was working on it. So this piece was made from a USGS topographical map of the mountains in New Mexico where I grew up. My very favorite hiking trail actually goes along the crest of that mountain there that you can see in the picture. So each of those pieces of fabric was precision cut based on a topographical line on the map. And then they're assembled, attached to a quilted base using floral wire and each layer is separated by beads. Sadly, that floral wire is sharp enough to poke through the fabric, but not sharp enough to poke through smoothly, not nearly as nice as a needle. And so it was, it was challenging. I, I bled a lot. Luckily, I didn't bleed on the front of the quilt. <laughs> and this is a quilt that's personally meaningful to me. That whole area of New Mexico burned down in 2012 in a really devastating wildfire. And just this spring, we had another wildfire in that same mountain range very near the home I grew up in. And it, it's just awful. I know in Australia, you suffer a lot with wildfires and bushfires. And it's heartbreaking when mm. these ecosystems that are so important to us are just eradicated. This quilt is about 45 inches wide by 30 inches tall. Most of the three-dimensional quilts, except that one with the spikes, are in that sort of 40 by 30, 40 by 40 range. That's about as big as I can easily ship. This one is bigger. This one is about five and a half feet tall by 
40 inches wide and the one with the undulations was bigger. And those two cost many hundreds of dollars to ship to a show. And then I decided I was not going to make things quite that big. So this is another pleated one in the same sort of technique as before. And this one is completely different. So this was part of a small series I did on abstracted flowers. This was very early in my exploration of 3D work. And I wanted to put it in there just as an example of other ways you can go with 3D, other ways you can make things 3D. So instead of the structure coming from the smocking or from fabric stiffener, all the structure in this piece, which is an abstracted iris, comes from wire that's been inserted in the petals in channels that I left open during the quilting. And so that means that the petals can be sculpted and the edges of the petals are finished rather than finishing with the binding. I have couched on roving wrapped wire. So I have found a local spinner who hand dyes wool fiber and spins it around a wire core. And so you can couch it on the edge of quilts, just like you would couch yarn, but it's wonderful because you can then sculpt it and you can create these undulating shapes. What a so, bizarre thing to, to think of doing. I know, I never would have thought of it. And then I showed up at a fiber festival and I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I have to have a bunch of this. I think it's worthwhile going to different festivals, isn't it? You do, or if you're just interested in any topic, if the minute you start delving into it, like the paper folding, like the fiber festivals, there's this whole other world that is just, amazing and yeah it's just there's some very clever people out there I so much enjoy going to creative events that are slightly outside my field of work I love seeing other quilt artists and I love going to quilt shows but it's so much more creatively stimulating to go to other types of media what are the spinners doing what are the tapestry people doing what are the paper art people doing because it's just I don't know you get so much inspiration so this one it has sharper edges in terms of paper folding Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was an experiment to see if I could make fabric hold a crease. And so this is a sculptural piece that was made out of a quilt that I hated. And I painted over it and chopped it up into little triangles. And then I stitched it down to aluminum window screen and sculpted it. And my sewing machine is not super happy about that, but it persevered. This was another one that involved more bleeding. The edges of aluminum window screen are scratchy as you're trying to push them. I quilted at that time on a domestic machine. So trying to mush that whole thing under the sewing machine was challenging, but it did enable me to generate crisp folds. Mm. And so you can see some of those there in that sculptural form. And now completely different again. Yeah, this was another one of the flowers. I love dahlias. This is abstracted dahlia petals. This one is bigger. And part of the reason that this one is able to be bigger is because it comes apart for shipping. And those three petals are held together by several wires that are inside them and they can be untwisted so the petals can nest to be shipped off to shows. And I will say that some of my most beloved Sakwa friends are people who first encountered me while trying to assemble this piece at a show. (laughs) From my instructions, you have to hold a flashlight inside one pedal so that you can see the holes to line up the wires to wire it back together. I bet you're so, popular. <laughs> I have so much appreciation for the curators and exhibition coordinators and exhibition organizers that put on all these things. It is so much work. It's especially a lot of work when you have weird non-traditional things like some of the ones I do. And so I just want to give a shout out to everybody who helps with the exhibition of fiber art. This one has elegance, I think, and I love the quilting on it as well. The quilting is my favorite part of this one. This is quilted in every neon shade of thread you could possibly imagine. The fabric, I thought it was boring when I was done painting it. It was very brown and green, and I thought I need some vibrance. And so all the vibrance comes from the quilting. And this is a slightly different style again. So this was when I was really more specifically focused on kirigami. So always growing up, I had done origami, Japanese paper folding, but I discovered 
through this internet rabbit hole, this separate art of kirigami, which is paper cutting and folding, and all of the wonderful forms, especially the repeating tessellating forms that are made by a combination of cutting and folding paper. And again, many of them are not amenable to fabric. Fabric is floppy and it doesn't hold a crease. And so it was a lot of fun. I did a whole series of these that explored how I could incorporate that idea of the cut paper in fabric here. This is another one from that same series. Do you still do those ones? I have ideas for several more. These pieces are cut. The quilt sandwich is cut using a laser cutter. So the fabric is painted and then quilted and then it's cut using a digital vector file that I make and put into the laser cutter. And that way you get these really precise cuts. You could do it with an X-Acto knife or with scissors, but the kirigami forms really rely on very precise cuts. And unfortunately, the place that I accessed a laser cutter has not been available since before COVID. So I haven't been able to do any more of these. <laughs> I, I have a silhouette cutter, but it will not cut a quilt sandwich. It will cut a single layer of fabric. And that's how I did the topographical quilt, but it will not cut a quilt sandwich. So I'm anxiously awaiting the day that my laser cutter becomes available again. My well, they're getting cheaper all the time. So maybe you have to buy your own. <laughs> I keep seeing more and more artists who are having their own and buying their own. One of the really nice things about the laser cutter as opposed to the silhouette is that it has a bigger cutting bed. But even though the cutting bed on the silhouette cutter, that's a digital cutter that connects to your home, is 12 by 24. And the laser cutter bed is like 18 by 36. So it's bigger, but it's still not that big. There is a silhouette cutter that's now 24 inches by 24 inches. Really? Yeah, maybe I need to just get one of those. I'm seriously considering it, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> as much as I love your 3D work, you have another body of work that is very different. And so let's talk about that. So I'm a cradle Episcopalian. That's part of the worldwide Anglican tradition. And it's a very liturgical religious tradition. And one of the things that I value the most about that tradition is the idea of corporate worship, the idea that people all over the world are praying with similar forms and similar prayers. And so about 10 years ago, I started a series largely inspired by illuminated manuscripts, but not exclusively, that depicted various parts of our Anglican worship service. And okay. so this is one of the pieces from that series. This is a piece that features the Gloria Patri, which is glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed throughout this series from a technical standpoint is sort of identifying a lot of different ways to incorporate text into my quilts, a lot of different approaches for putting text into my quilts. And in some cases, you'll see the text almost recedes. It's more of an abstract design element. This mm -hmm. is actually a good example of that. You can read that text if you really try in Latin. <laughs> and one of the things that this quilt was meant to be very meditative, almost like a labyrinth, not a maze, but a meditation oh. labyrinth. It can be hung either direction. It's the same right side up and upside down. And it was really an exercise in meditation to make it. This one is more abstract, maybe more echoes of some of my abstract dimensional work just in the colors and the forms. And this one features text that was added to the quilt using cyanotyping. So that text there in the middle, which is very abstracted, you might be able to read it if you were very up close in person, but that's my handwriting of one of our prayers of confession. And that felt like a very personal prayer when I wanted to have my handwriting there. One of the things that was especially fun about this quilt is that it was one in a series where I was exploring transparency. So that middle ring is connected to the outer ring only by thread. And so that sort of white circle oh. around the middle is actually open. And I did a whole series of these where there were basically holes cut in things. You have a but the water soluble stabilizer between them. Yeah. So in this case, I used a water soluble stabilizer to stitch over. In other things where there's holes, I just cut the holes out after. But my sewing machine got really angry when I tried to stitch with no stabilizer. This was my first COVID quilt. I feel like as artists, we probably most of us have a COVID quilt. And this one features one of the prayers that we use in our lay prayer services. So the prayer services that we use not 
on Sundays at church. And each of those squares has the same prayer and they're meant to symbolize our Zoom windows. At the beginning of COVID, our family started to have weekly Zoom prayer services together and our church started to have weekly Zoom prayer services together. And I know we're all sick of Zoom, but it really enabled us to stay connected in ways that were very meaningful to me personally. I actually think I've spent more time with my grandmother, who's 93, in these past two years because of these Zoom services than ever. She lives 500 miles from me. I would get to see her twice a year. And so it's been a real privilege to get to do that. And so this was a tree whose roots connect us to each other and to the world through our Zoom screens. And they're all separate elements too. They're all separate elements, again, held together by, by just stitching. And again, with water-soluble stabilizer that then has been washed away. Oh, there's my studio. Yeah. <laughs> How large is it? I have a studio out in my backyard. It's 20 feet by 20 feet, 400 square feet. It's a real privilege to have that studio. I built it in my backyard about 10 or 11 years ago, and it really expanded my practice. I was able to do things that I could not do when I was working in a tiny little bedroom in my house. So I love those design walls over there on that wall. You can see they slide and you can pin stuff to them and they hide my <laughs> shelves. <laughs> I have just recently started quilting on a Bernina Q16 midarm after 10 or 15 years of quilting on my domestic machine. It finally got tired of quilting through all the things I was subjecting it to. And so yeah. I, I got it. I have machine. a Bernina Q20 and love it. It's just amazing. <laughs> It, I'm having so much fun. It's just so much easier and smoother and it's fantastic. It has a, you notice it has a fence around it. And that's because my puppy gets underneath there and stands on the foot pedal. And so then you're <laughs> trying to stop or start and he's helping and it's very, not very helpful. So. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> We're just going to talk briefly about this one of your liturgical quilts called Creed. So this quilt is one that's, I would say, more characteristic of most of the ones in the liturgical series. But again, I was really inspired by the idea of illuminated manuscripts, by the symbolism that you find in the borders of illuminated manuscripts. I've spent quite a bit of time looking at old illuminated manuscripts. One of my favorite resources is the British Library's digital records. They've digitized all of their illuminated historical manuscripts. This piece is much more characteristic of most of the ones in the liturgical series. It features, again... Latin, some of the first lines from our creed, which is one of the statements of belief. But one of the things I think this piece really shows that I love is the ability to do lots of really fun quilting. This is the fabric pulls for this work. The background of this piece is a silk sari. I had a boyfriend from India a long time ago, and he brought me back a bunch of silk saris, and I didn't really wear them, but they make wonderful backgrounds for quilts. And I use lots of velvets and shiny fabrics and silks. I really love the iridescence that comes from those. So there in the front are a whole bunch of hand-painted silk velvets that my mom and I made. And it's always really fun. I pull out a bunch of stuff and then just refine as I go. <laughs> the designs, I work mostly in Adobe Illustrator and the designs start there with particularly the text layouts, which have to be very precise. And then you can fill in as you go with the extra elements. So I always get the text aligned properly and I use that to either make silk screens for the quilts where the text is silk screened on or as cutting patterns for my silhouette. So here you can see that for this particular piece all the letters were all cut out of a shiny gold fabric with the silhouette and then fused down. And how do so you, you stabilize see... your fabric with the cutter? The fabric has fusible on the back. I use Wonder Under and I buy it by the bolt from my local chain retailer when I have a coupon. And then I paint it over with a watered down fabric stiffener in order to give a much crisper hand. And then I get much better cuts that way. So it's the same fabric stiffener I used to stabilize those big sculptural quilts, only just thinner. I know Kestrel uses Mod Podge. I just use the fabric stiffener because that's what I have. And I found that Otherwise, the edges of the letters get really ravelly and untidy looking, even on the silhouette, but I get really crisp cuts if I've stiffened up the fabric just a little. And it's still, you can still stitch through it, no problem. So this is along the way, you can see the larger illuminated initials, again, made out of 
velvet and silks. All those ones at the bottom, the I, C, and S, those are all made out of silk ties that I've disassembled and cut out. I love the patterns that are on silk ties, and I don't know any men in my life that still wear them, so I've acquired a fairly robust collection. (laughs) (laughs) Now, this is very interesting, but is it connected to this quilt? One of the things that's so much fun, okay, so illuminated manuscripts were filled in the borders with all of these symbols. So animals and plants and all of the plants had different symbolic meaning. And I don't know any of those because I'm not from the 14. But one of the things that's been so much fun for me as I've made these is to incorporate my own personally meaningful symbols and plants and flowers and animals into the quilts. So this is a grove of aspen trees. It's here in this little arch that sits at the top of the quilt. You can see here that's aspen trees and pinyon pine trees and apple trees, all of which are uh, trees that grow where I grew up. They're really special parts of what happened in our mountains. And then those are two of my dogs. So all my animals are in this quilt, all distributed throughout, as well as trees and flowers that have personal symbolism for me. Here you can see the quilting from the back. And you can also see where one of those pieces of hand dyed silk velvet bled through. (laughs) That's why it's green there. I was very sad about that. It was a challenge to deal with. Beautiful quilting. Thank you. I really enjoy the quilting. And this is another thing that I love about illuminated manuscripts. So when you look at the manuscripts, they're filled with text. You can imagine some monk in the 1300s precisely writing this text. And then at the end of the lines, if there's extra space, They're filled with little doodles and little space filling abstract designs. And that's just like exactly like quilting. (laughs) And so I love, you could see there towards the top of this photo, those little sort of Trinity round symbols in there. I love leaving space to incorporate some of these quilted doodles. They don't have any meaning. They're just decorative. This is a quilt? This is a quilt. This is one of the most special ones in this series. This is from one of our Eucharistic prayers. This is the prayers that we have in the service before communion. And it talks all about how God created the planets and the suns and all the galaxies. And so this is my first religion and science quilt. I'm a scientist, I'm a person of faith, and I don't think those two things are contradictory. And I feel like there's a lot that we can learn by studying science. I feel like it's so important to believe in science, believe in data, and that doesn't necessarily have to contradict being a person of faith. And so this quilt features this prayer that we have before communion, but all of those symbols around the edge are about evolution and about my Garden of Eden. So if you start over there on the far, those are the sort of primordial ooze from the beginning of time. And then the undersea hydrothermal vents where the earliest life forms were detected under the sea. And then the stromatolites, there's stromatolites in Australia. Lisa, I wanna come to Australia and see the stromatolites. The stromatolites were some of the earliest oxygen generating bacteria. And so they're basically responsible for all the life that's evolved because they were responsible for generating the oxygen that created our atmosphere that supports life now. And they were these tiny little bacteria and they formed into these big rock like structures and they still are living now three and a half billion years after they first evolved. And there are a few places on earth where you can see them. They're boring to look at. They just look like big rocks, but there are some in Australia. The final quilt that we have is the Lord's Prayer. So this one was made, the music that's there for this one was written by a very dear friend of mine who was a organist and choir master at our church. And so this is some of her service music that we sung the Lord's Prayer in our services. And so it was a real privilege to get to make this quilt to feature her music. That was absolutely fascinating, Shannon. I've loved your 3D work for ages and seeing your liturgical work has actually doubled my appreciation of your work. It's just incredible how you can mix the science and the faith together. I loved your explanation. That was really great. So I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today and I'm sure you're doing wonderful work on the SACWA board. SACWA is a wonderful organization. And if you're not aware of it, the link is below, as are all of Shannon's links. 
just check out the description box below and you'll see links to everything. And I do encourage everybody to check out the SACWA website because there's so much eye candy. And it'd be wonderful if you feel like joining us. If you like this sort of work, then SACWA is definitely where you should go to. I'm going to put a link at the end of this video to Vicki Conley, your mother's work, because I just think it's wonderful that mother and daughter have gone on this journey together. It's just been terrific. So thanks very much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun to get to talk to you and to get to share my work with your audience. And I look forward to following your work as we go forward. And thank you for the call back to my mom. It's really great to see how we share so many inspirations in the desert Southwest. And yet our work is really different. I would really appreciate it if you would like to click on the subscribe button below. And you might also even see a little button that says thanks. And that's a recent development by YouTube to encourage us content providers to uh, maybe if you just care to donate a couple of dollars, that would be really wonderful. You don't have to, but that's what that button's for. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Mm -hmm.